Hi and welcome to God Undiluted, where we speak all things the Word of God unedited, uncut for this our generation as we are led only by the Holy Spirit. So without further ado, let's just pray. Father God, how I thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity to come on here and to share your word, oh God, as you have been teaching me. Holy Spirit, I ask that you come and release your revelation. Come in and take charge. May I decrease as you increase. It is my prayer that, Lord, everybody who listens to this word, may you speak to their hearts, may you minister to them, oh Lord. And I pray that in all things, Jesus alone be glorified. Amen, amen, and amen. Honestly, thank you so much for joining me today. I want to go straight into the word because I don't want to take too much of your time. I want you to really stay and listen to the whole thing. So I'm going to just go right to the point. Today, I want to talk about how, you know, the journey of reading the Bible myself saved me. And the key thing that I want to talk about today is how through this journey, I have learned that there is a standard. One of the lies that the enemy had planted in my heart, and I know that there are many who are like how I was. The lie was that, you know what, I've received the Lord Jesus as, you know, the personal savior of my life and I'm, and I'm good, right? I can, I can rest easy, like <laughs> I'm good. I want to unpack that together today, you know, using the scripture of God and for us to really think about, you know, what it truly means to receive Christ as Lord and personal savior of our life as is in the scripture okay so the the first scripture that i want us to open up together and go to is is in the book of romans so let's start with romans yeah so romans chapter 10 verse 9 right so the bible says in romans chapter 10 verse 9 if you declare with your mouth jesus is lord yeah a mouth confession and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So the, the condition for being saved, like the, the, the condition is, 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 is clear. It's, 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 you know, you, 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 you confess with your mouth. The word says here, I'll read it again. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. So I, I, I want us to continue with that because, yes, you, you've confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. But the Bible continues to say, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no different. Oh, it's not really doing it. Welcome to God Undiluted, where we speak all things the Word of God unedited and cut for this our generation as we are led only by the Holy Spirit. So without further ado, let's just pray. Father God, thank you for this amazing opportunity to come on here and to share the word that you have been teaching me. How I pray, oh God, that you just take over everything, oh Father, and this word germinates the fruit that it is meant to germinate in the heart of everyone that listens. Holy Spirit, I ask that you come in and take charge. May I decrease as you increase. And Lord, may it not be about my opinion, but may your word itself, oh God, have the final say in everything that I speak about. And ultimately, may all glory, may all honor go right back to Jesus. Amen, amen, and amen. I hope you've had an amazing week. Today, I want to talk about how really getting into the scripture, reading the Bible saved me. And it will become clearer as we continue to listen and, and talk about it, rather, as you continue to listen and I continue to talk. <laughs> so please stay with me right to the very end, okay? I can't seem to be getting my words out as, uh, see? Hi and welcome to God Undiluted. Here we speak all things the word of God and edited and cut for this our generation as the Holy Spirit alone leads us. So without further ado, let's just pray. 
Father God, thank you for this amazing opportunity to come on here and to share your word as I am learning it. It is my prayer that it does what it is meant to do. Oh, Father, it accomplishes the purpose for which you gave it to me. It is my prayer that the Holy Spirit alone leads, the Holy Spirit alone teaches. Father God, release your revelation. And I pray that Jesus alone be glorified. Amen, amen, and amen. Friends, thank you for joining me here on God Undiluted. I want to talk about something that's special, something that is so close to my heart today. You know, how the Bible literally saved me, how reading the word of God myself has saved me. Okay, so please stick with me. We're going to open a lot of scriptures today because I pray that this word does something in your heart and helps you on your journey with God. So we're going to start in the book of Romans, right? Romans chapter 10. Yeah, Romans chapter 10 from verse 9. So the Bible says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Yeah, the Bible continues to say in verse 10, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So the key thing that I want us to take away from this first scripture is that the, the, the start point that we are learning here from the book of Romans is that your mouth and your heart are critical to you being a Christian. With your mouth, you profess that Jesus is Lord, that God actually sent his only begotten son here on the earth, right? And he died for your sins. Your mouth is professing that and your heart believes it right? Your heart believes it. So that's what we want to hold on to. Let's keep reading. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. Yeah. So Romans chapter 8, verse 1, the Bible says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit, please underline the law of the spirit, who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Please underline law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. Hallelujah. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So please also underline those who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Holy Spirit, help me. What am I trying to say, my friends? What I'm trying to say is this. A lot of the things that we say when it comes to receiving Jesus as a Lord and personal Savior is not always the complete story. I was one of those people that, you know, for so many years as well, I lived in bondage, you know, in my head. I thought, you know, I've received Jesus as Lord and personal Savior of my life. I've confessed with my mouth and, you know, oh, that's great. And I believe him in my heart that he did this for me. But yet my life had no fruit that evidenced belief, right? If you told me that there was a snake under my chair and I believed it, my actions would prove my belief, right? Yet many of us say that, you know what? Yes, I've received Jesus. Yet we, when we hear that there's a standard to live by, we're like, oh no, I'm not under law. I'm not under law. Like, it, 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 let, me, let me just dissect that and we're going to use scripture, not opinion. We will let scripture answer the questions for us, right? The Bible is telling us here in Romans chapter eight that there is now no condemnation. But there's a people for whom there's no condemnation. And let me tell you who these people are. Who are in Christ Jesus? Because through Christ Jesus, right? So they're in Christ Jesus. There's now no condemnation to the people who are in Christ Jesus, right? Why are people who are in Christ not under condemnation? Let me continue reading. Because through Christ, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free. So by being in Jesus, you're now under a different law. It doesn't mean you're not under law, <laughs> right? The Bible is making it explicitly clear that those that are in Christ Jesus are not under condemnation because they are operating from a different law. The law of sin and death, the law, the Levitical law was the law of sin and death that Jesus fulfilled. That law, you're no longer under that law, but you're under a new law, not no law, <laughs> right? 
but the law of the spirit. That's what the Bible says. Let me read it for you again so you understand. This is not my opinion. This is the word of God. The Bible says, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit, and it has a capital S, the law of the spirit, who gives life, has set you free. So the law of the spirit sets us free. The law of the spirit sets people who are in Jesus free. You come away from the law of sin and death into the law of the spirit because you are in Christ Jesus. Without the sacrifice of Jesus, we would not have been worthy to come into the law of the spirit. So this shows us, my friend, that they are spiritual laws. Being a child of God does not mean you are not under law. <laughs> it means you are under a different law. Do you understand? So can you see how the enemy had us, well, had me in bondage and now I'm no longer in bondage and I pray that this word frees you, right? To understand that in Christ Jesus, you enter a different law, the law of the spirit. And it is the law of the spirit, the spirit who, the spirit who gives life, yeah, has set you free from the law of sin and death. You understand? So it is a lie from the pit of hell when you think, I'm not under law, I'm not under law, and it ends there. I received Jesus as Lord and personal Savior of my, of my life. I profess with my mouth, I'm not under law. <laughs> the enemy smiles because he knows, oh, you don't really know what you're saying. You don't really know this Jesus that you're saying you've received. You've, you don't really know what the scripture actually says. The scripture says there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus, who are in Christ and because of Christ, they are no longer under my law, the law of sin and death, but they are under the law of the spirit. So if you don't know which law you are in, the enemy can use the law of sin and death and condemn you because you are not actually under the law of the spirit. For what the law was powerless to do, that is the law of sin and, um, and death, right? Because of its wicked flesh, God finished it off through Jesus. What Jesus finished was the price, right? That we all had to pay because of the law of sin and death right but it ends with us knowing that you know what at the end of the day which is <laughs> verse 4 in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us jesus paid all of that right in us listen 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 this is not for everyone as well is might be met fully in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the spirit please please stick with me i want to just do that justice again right that last part the Bible is telling us here that, and so he condemned sin in the flesh, Jesus, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us. Us who were never worthy in our own works, us who could have never done it in our own doing to become holy because the law, you can think of the children of Israel, left, right and center, they could not meet that law. Jesus came and he finished it off, right? And the law is fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. You understand? So I hope this is helping to open your eyes to say, hey, there's a standard to these things. These things that we can jump about and say, we're not under law. And the whole church says, yes, amen, amen. Is a dangerous, incomplete gospel because we end up with a church that is full to the brim. Mega churches, but with people who are not saved. People who think they're on their way to heaven, they're saved, but they're not saved because they're not meeting the, <laughs> the, 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 the basic requirements of the scripture, which are, you know, yes, you've confessed with, my, with your mouth. Number two, yes, you believe in your heart. Number three, now you move away from the law of sin and death into the law of the spirit. And you walk according to the spirit, not according to the flesh. But you have a person who's in the church who will be saying, yes, I've received Jesus. I'm on my way to heaven. But they are <laughs> living a life that is not according to the spirit of God. This is not easy, my friends. But this is the gospel, right? That was the thing that I wanted to share with you. That for me, God opened my eyes to. And then I recognized that, my goodness, Lord, I want to live in the spirit. I want the law of the spirit, the spiritual laws of God to govern my life. Right? Because I don't want to be under no law. <laughs> because there's no in between. If I'm not under the law of the spirit, I'm under the law of sin and death. 
So I don't want to be ever tricked by the enemy for me to think I'm not under law. Because if I just say I'm not under law, I'm ending up in the law of sin and death. Let me carry on. Let me open more scriptures. Let's go to James chapter 1. Okay. You get in there? Bear with me. So James chapter 1, yeah. In verse 22, the Bible says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently, intently, underline that word, into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. This is the New Testament, my friends. It's not the Old Testament. So we are learning again from James that there is something here about us as children of God needing to not be deceived by the enemy, right? By becoming only people who listen to the word, becoming people who jump around and say, I'm saved, I'm delivered, right? But actually are not doing what the word actually says. And he continues to tell us that, listen, the idea is supposed to be that we look intently. That is verse 25. But whoever looks intently, intently speaks of intentionality, intentional commitment. So it doesn't mean I just kind of glance at the mirror. I intently look at the mirror and learn, oh, okay, you know, sometimes maybe actually when I smile a little bit, I have a little bit of a little dimple, but I, I guess that's fat for me. <laughs> right? I have a little bit of that. Oh, oh, okay. This is what it is. So you are looking intently. You're studying. You are intentionally looking right into. And what are we looking into? What does the book of James tell us we're looking into? The perfect law that gives freedom. Most of us friends, our definition of, you know, freedom does not involve law. Yet the Bible is telling us that intently looking into the perfect law that gives freedom. And we want to know, okay, what is this perfect law that gives freedom, right? So we started off with knowing that there's a law of the spirit. There's the law of the spirit. We learned that in, in the book of Romans, the spirit of God, right? Let me give you another scripture just to back that up a little bit, right? We're going to go to the book of John chapter eight. I have to put my notes here <laughs> because I don't want to miss this because I want scripture to speak for itself. Yeah. So we are in John chapter eight verse 31 the bible says to the jews who had believed him jesus said if you hold to my teaching you are really my disciples then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free that's what jesus said right that's what jesus said so it is important for us, my friends, to recognize here that Jesus himself, Jesus himself in the book of John is saying, if you hold to my teaching and you are really my disciples, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Yeah. I want to make sure I've not missed any of the verses that I want you to understand. The perfect law is the law of the spirit and is the law of the spirit that brings freedom. Like we're learning. We're going to go back to James. Right. Okay. It's a lot of maneuvering today, but I want the scripture to speak to itself. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So the law of the spirit gives freedom, my friends. As a child of God, there is a law that governs your life. It is not the law of sin and death, but it is the law of the spirit. So it is important to understand that if you're living under the law of the spirit, there is fruit. That's when we read the book of Galatians, which talks about the fruit of the spirit, right? The fruit of the spirit. Let's, let's go to it, actually, because I think it's important. It's important for you to understand that what does this fruit actually look like, right? To understand what is the law of the spirit? What is the evidence of somebody who is actually walking in the law of the spirit as per the scripture? So bear with me. Let's just go to the book of Galatians. So this is what it says. The book of Galatians in Galatians chapter 5 from verse 13. It talks to us about life by the spirit. This is our law, my friends. If you are in Christ Jesus, 
there is a law, the law of the spirit. This is it. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. The law of the spirit is fulfilled by this command by this one command love your neighbor as yourself if you bite and devour each other watch out or you will be destroyed by each other so i say walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh they're in conflict with each other so you are not to do whatever you want but if you are led by the spirit you are not under law the acts of the flesh are obvious it goes into sexual immorality impurity debauchery idol idolatry witchcraft hatred discord jealousy fits of rage selfish ambition all of those kind of things envy drunkenness and the like i warn you as i did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of god but the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace forbearance kindness goodness faithfulness all of that all that good stuff right those who belong to christ jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires since we live by the spirit let us keep in step with the spirit right so i hope you understand that when the bible says you don't live under law it does not mean that there is no law it means you are not under the law of sin and death, but you are now alive in Christ to the law of the spirit. So it's important for you to understand the spiritual laws, to understand that if something is happening in your life and you are standing before God and you are warfaring, listen, if there is life in your, if in your life you are in sexual immorality, you are fornicating, you are doing all these things, it, it, it. It affects your witness. It affects your prayer life. It affects your power as a child of God. It is not even about being judged. It is about recognizing that there are spiritual laws. And in the spirit, my friends, <laughs> if your life in and of itself does not represent Jesus, you're not covered by the blood. Imagine it's raining right now in the UK. Imagine I'm walking next to somebody who has an umbrella, right? And I choose that I want freedom. And so I can run around and do whatever. And I get wet and I start crying that I get wet. It doesn't make sense. The person with the umbrella is not going to continue running around following me. You understand? Yet we expect that of Jesus. We are so happy with saying, oh, you know what? He, he, he lives the nine to nine and he chases after the one. Oh, how wonderful. How amazing. I love that. There's a mighty woman of God called Celestial. Her channel is called The Master's Voice. I love that so much because it's so real and talking about the, the righteousness of God and, 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 and how our God is a sovereign God. Listen, it's not about you going off looking for puddles and excitement in the rain and Jesus running after you with an umbrella, running after you with the, with the, with the, with the, with the covering. Right? It's not like that though. We want to believe that. We want to think that the love of God looks like that. But the Bible tells us in, Re in Revelations that whom the Lord loves, he rebukes. You understand? But we want to, I don't know, we've created and manufactured our own, not our, because I'm not part of that now. Thank God. Thank you, Jesus. But people have manufactured their own Jesus, their own gospel. This, this person <laughs> that runs after them with an umbrella, runs after them with an umbrella. That is not, read Revelations and see the identity of Jesus. See what Jesus is saying to his own churches, right? He speaks in Revelation chapter 2. Of all the different states of the church, he's not speaking to unbelievers. He's speaking to the churches. And you will see the standard that he set for his children, for the church, for the remnant, for those that he's coming for. You know what I mean? So you, Jesus is not running around with an umbrella while you're there thinking, oh, this is a cute puddle. Let me go and explore that puddle. That puddle of sexual immorality. That puddle of, 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 of lying. That puddle of whatever right and jesus is just there running around with an umbrella following you no my friends we choose ourselves to abide under the umbrella of jesus you bring yourself into submission right into the obedience of christ that is the true gospel my friends that we are called to come under the umbrella of christ the blood of jesus covers us the blood of jesus makes our garments clean in our own strength we cannot live this holy life in our own strength we cannot do these things but let that not be a passport my friends for you to justify foolishness graduate in your walk with god right because you can't be on a journey with god like this that looks like this where you know what every sunday you're on a prayer line to repent over the same thing 
you are there on a prayer line and you think that God is active in the life in your life. <laughs> Whew, guys, it's not like that. There's a standard for children of God. Yes, we all sin. I sin in thinking and doing. But if I say, God, I know this is a sin. I'm sorry, but I'm just going to that sneaky link. Oh God, I'm so sorry. I know this is sin, but I'm just stealing money from my boss. Forgive me. That is not actually a heart that has believed in the true nature of who God is. There is no fear of God in that. And when you are not in the fear of God, then my friends, you are un you, you've taken yourself out of the umbrella. You've taken yourself out. The condition of being in the umbrella is believing that Jesus is who he is, who he says he is, right? And living in the law of the spirit. But if you want to do other things, you're coming out of that law into another law. I hope you, you're seeing this, my friends, right? May God help us to recognize that. Yes, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But we're justified by being in Jesus. But to be in Jesus, there's fruits. The Bible tells us what it looks like to be in Jesus, right? You can't keep going like that, my friend. Refuse for your Christian walk with God to be a walk where, you know what, you are intentionally sinning. You're intentionally, willfully going back to the same sin and thinking, I will repent on Sunday. Then you've not really, 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 truly received Jesus. It's sad to think there are many churches with many people who are going day in, day out to those churches, but they are, unfortunately, I'm going to say this, head to hell because they've not actually really received Jesus. Receiving Jesus is evidenced by what you do. Does that make sense? I want to break that down a little bit. When I say receiving Jesus is evidenced by what you do and thinking about what the scripture is saying is you are saying no to the law of sin and death and yes to, this, to the law of the spirit, which has standards, right? So if I'm there and I say, oh, you know what? Jesus is Lord. I received him with my mouth and I say I believed him in my heart and yet I don't act like it, then my belief is questionable. Does that make sense? And churches that don't preach the full gospel of God, they're dangerous because they don't get people to, to, to think about what true repentance looks like. My friends, let me tell you what true repentance looks like based on the scripture. Okay. So let's go to second Corinthians. I told you that we have loads of scriptures today because I don't want to share with you my opinions, right? I want to point you to scripture and then you make your own decision. So let's go to second Corinthians. I have here chapter six, verse 14. Actually, let's start with second Corinthians chapter seven, verse 10. Yes, let's start with this one. So this is Paul. He was writing a letter and the letter was quite scathing <laughs> um, to the Corinthians church in 1 Corinthians, um, that whole letter. And then in 2 Corinthians, this is what he's saying. But let, let's go to it. So the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse, verse 10. But maybe let's even start from verse 8. This is Paul. Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I am happy. Not because you were made sorry. You understand? Not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led to repentance. So you can be sorry and not repentant. You understand? So we have many people who are sorry that they've done certain things and think, oh, you know, yes, I've repented. But no, you are sorry you did it, but you've not repented. Let's continue. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. My friends, Godly sorrow is different to worldly sorrow. You being sorrowful and it ending there brings death. Let me read this again because I really want you to get it. Godly sorrow brings repentance. That leads to salvation. Godly sorrow brings repent. Repentance is what leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. 
See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. Godly sorrow has got fruit. Godly sorrow brought earnestness, brought, you know, a fire, a new fresh fire in the Corinth church, right? And that is the same thing with us, my friends, that when we have experienced that godly sorrow, that my God, Father, now that I see what I was doing in this, forgive me. I repent. I turn from this sin. I turn from this way of living. And I now honor you with my body. I now honor you with my everything. There is a sense of earnestness in that. That will transform your character and your behavior by the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? You will lean more into the Holy Spirit. Say, Holy Spirit, change me. Holy Spirit, transform me. Holy Spirit, I can't go back to that sin. I can't keep doing this. There is brokenness that leads to real repentance. But many of us have experienced worldly sorrow. And we think we've repented. And the Bible is telling us that worldly sorrow will lead to death. And it's talking about a spiritual death. Right? No wonder why we see that story in Matthew of the wedding feast where, you know, people have been invited to the wedding and some people didn't show up. Those are the people who did not say yes to the gospel, right? They didn't say yes to the gospel. They were invited and then it's like, oh, okay, fine. You know, they're not coming. And then there was these ones who were shown favor, right? The gentles who were shown favor when they were not the original intended guests. But because the original guests didn't show up, Jesus is like, go and, you know, the bride, the, the, the groom is like, go, go and bring, you know, people from wherever who want to come to the wedding, right? And people who came to the wedding, they were happy. They were not deserving. They were undeserved guests. I'll put the scripture there. It wasn't part of my notes, but I'll put the scripture there. It's in Matthew. They were undeserved guests. They came, right, for the wedding that they were not supposed to even be part of. The banquet was amazing. Yeah, but the Bible tells us that there, there was this one man. This one man did not come wearing wedding clothes. And the bride, the, 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 the bridegroom says, mate, wear your wedding clothes. And this person had no excuse. And the bridegroom says, come on, chuck this person out. And this person was chucked out. And yet we sit here and we tell ourselves as Christians, ah, you know what? It's fine. It doesn't matter. There's no standard. My friends. May it be not that we are naive to thinking that we're not under a law as children of God. We are under the law of the spirit. And as we are under the law of the spirit, it means that true believing in Jesus allows you to be in true repentance and knowing that in and of your own strength, you cannot do it. Your salvation was free. You were invited to the wedding for free. No one works for their salvation. You were invited. We were all invited for free. And we said yes to that invitation with our mouths. But now we need to walk the talk, right? Get your wedding clothes ready by the help of the Holy Spirit who comes and says, hey, listen, as you desire to walk with God, as your heart is transformed, I will help you. When there's an error, when there's sin, I will reveal it to you, not from a place of judgment, but so that you can be broken, godly sorrow and change so that you stay under the umbrella. May we not be a stumbling block for anyone to come into heaven because we're telling them that do not judge. It doesn't matter. We're all sinners anyway, right? And have churches full of young people who are living lives out of the umbrella, and yet they're coming to church every single Sunday. May we not be like that. May we, people who have, God gives the platform to speak, know that love also corrects. God says in Revelations, those whom he loves, he rebukes right? Jesus spoke for himself in Revelation chapter 2, what his issues were with the churches. And may we not be naive to those things, my friends, right? May we not be naive. I pray that as I come to the end of the message today, you'll understand that you cannot do this in your own strength. You need the Holy Spirit. You need to be under the law of the Spirit. So why don't you repent genuinely? of all the things that hinder you. Why don't you repent genuinely, godly sorrow genuinely, be really broken and say, I don't want to live in the sin anymore, God. I want to know you. I want to understand you. I never want to be that one person who will make it to the wedding, but then without my clothes and be chucked out. 
I never want to be one of those people whom you will say one day, you know, but we prophesied in your name and Jesus is like, I never knew you, right? You know, those cousins that you never speak to, you never know, you know, we are related somehow, you know, but then when you're in trouble, you're like, oh, hi, I'm your cousin from your mother's side. <laughs> and you're like, well, wait, what are you here doing? I don't know you. And you're like, but we're related, but we're related. No, I don't actually know you. There's a standard for us, my friends. So I pray that we repent today. We repent. I have made it a point now to die daily, to say, God, even for the sins that I know and the sins that I don't know, search my heart and know me. See if there's any wickedness in me, oh God, and help me. I will never be perfect, but I want to be on a journey. I don't want to be stagnant. You know, imagine going on a journey where, you know, you, you the car starts raving and everything, and then, you know, you, you get off, and then you say, I, I want to go to the toilet. And then the car is about to go and you get off. You go nowhere. Many people are on a journey that is stagnant, going nowhere. May it be that our journey looks like we are on the car. We are moving. We're on the journey. Yes, sometimes life happens. We need to, we stop the car. We come off. We offload what is not of God that may be, has sipped in into the journey. We offload it. We repent. We are washed clean. We keep it moving with Jesus. Right? Not to be like, oh, we were, oh, we, I was, I was, <laughs> I live in the UK, so I'm going to use this example. And I live in the Midlands. I, I was, I was in, Le I was in Leicester, you know, on my journey to London. Something happened. I needed to go back home. And then I, just as I make it to Leicester again, I go back home. Leicester again, I go back home. No, friends, be on a journey. You know, you're in Leicester, graduate from Leicester. Come on, get to Northampton. <laughs> you know what I mean? Graduate from Northampton, get to Luton. Graduate from Luton. Get to the next city. Is it Milton Keynes? Graduate. Yes, we are all going to struggle on the journey. The Holy Spirit is with us. But strive to grow in your walk with God. Don't stay at the same level of just thinking, you know, I sin and you feel sorrow and that's it. Because that will lead to death. So I pray that you also are challenged by this word to get into the word, to really know Jesus, to know what it means to be a Christian. Because the true prize, my friends, is not God giving us cars, houses, house, uh, husbands, children. The true prize is making it to London, making it to the end, making it, you know, in our walk with him. No surprises. Yes, we're going to mess up, but let's make it. See Jesus as it. He is it, right? Not a way through to get to your husband, to get to your children, to get to a ministry, to get to popularity, to get to material wealth. A lot of churches... All the messages are very motivational towards what you can become on this side of life and not about what you need to become to get to enjoy with Jesus, right? Read Revelation. It will encourage you and challenge you at the same time to seek after him. I'm going to finish it off here, my friends. And I pray that if you've been listening to this message, maybe this is your first time. The title, you know, got you to be curious and the Holy Spirit enabled you to stay. He's been preparing you to receive the true news of Jesus. And you've not received Jesus as Lord and personal Savior of your life. I want to take you through this journey, okay? I want to speak life into you. I want to pray with you. But like the word has told us, you need to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is who he is. So let's pray. Father God, thank you for giving me an opportunity to hear this good news of Jesus. Father, I confess with my mouth that I was in bondage. I was in bondage to the law of sin and death. And today I make a decision to live that and come under the law of the spirit. I receive the Lord Jesus who qualifies me to be under the law of the spirit. I receive Jesus as Lord and personal over my life. Lord and personal savior over my life. I confess with my mouth that he came on this earth and he died on that cross for me. I confess it and I believe it with my heart. And as a result of that, I turn away from the life of sin. I turn away from being under the law of sin and choose to become alive in Jesus. So I pray that the Holy Spirit comes into my life and it helps me to walk my life in a way that is worthy and honorable as per the word of God. I pray this and receive you, Jesus, from today onwards. Amen. And if you've prayed that prayer, listen, I want to help you become a true disciple of Christ. You understand? Not just to say I received Jesus because this girl was speaking, <laughs> right? This lady, whatever you see me as. <laughs> Some people call me Ma. I'm like, oh, calm down. Calm down, love. It's okay. <laughs> but I understand sometimes it's a cultural thing. But hey, listen, I'm not, uh, you know, you know. But my point is this. I want to help you become a true disciple. 
right? So email me, I'll put my email on the screen there. You've done the first most important step. Well done. Now let's learn to live under the law of the spirit where there is freedom, right? In the kingdom of God, law and freedom come together. But it's the law of the spirit that brings freedom, freedom from sin, freedom from death. So please email me. I would love to walk this journey with you and disciple you. And until next time, my friends, I will let you be. May you stay under the umbrella, right? Stand under the umbrella of Jesus. He's not going to keep running around after you. You understand? While you're there chasing after puddles. <laughs> no. He's here. He is steady. Run to him. Stay under that umbrella. Get into the word. Pray. Right? And see what he will do with your life. Until next week. Bye for now.